Hello, and welcome to the Squeaky Bum Time Podcast with Mike and Laurent. It is Tuesday, June 15th. In this episode, Scotland gets shicked. England live in a world of hyperbole. Spain, Spains. But first, Mike, let's talk about something really serious. Tell us your feelings about Christian Eriksen and what we saw in the Denmark-Finland game. We like to keep things lighthearted, but this was one where sport was second, third, fourth, and fifth uh, in our minds. But uh, tell us how you felt with, uh, with uh, the Eriksen. Uh, terrified. You know, I mean, in the way that he goes down, I watched a lot. I watched the replay a lot because I was like, what the fuck happened? And, and frankly, I was trying to hope against hope that it was something other than his heart. Right. I was like, no, we had heat stroke. No, he had, I'm come. I'm not. And I'm not saying I was playing doctor. I was like making shit up to make it sound less bad than it was, but it was just horrifying. Um, yeah. Couple really important things about that. First and foremost, um, you know, I, I, I going to pronounce this guy's name wrong. Simon, the, the captain of the Denmark team, Simon Kiar, I believe. Kiar um, sounds right jumps right on him because he falls over. He's sort of on his side and he puts him on his back. He makes sure he doesn't swallow his tongue. Like he was on his shit. He didn't, he didn't administer CPR right away, but he like basically like made sure he was some like somewhat stabilized until the people could get, you know, across the field to him. And then he recognizes the sort of privacy moment, right? Yes. Where he, they form a shield around Erickson. They even hold up like, blankets or sheets so that no one yeah can see that that was on. this one of the scarier things for me that yeah like, yeah because you know, nobody like, this wants guy might be dead right now yeah because there's cpr going on and yeah. then between he and casper schmeichel they take care of erickson's girlfriend slash baby mama uh they're not married but they have kids whatever uh and they you know because she's like my guy is gonna die here yeah and he was... you know in the aftermath the players didn't know if they just had their fucking talisman and their guy who was going to get them through uh die on the pitch well I mean, that yeah. was legit so we'll talk about the players and, and the, the decision to play on in a, in a minute here but i want to stay in in the moment because it it was cardiac arrest yep that they confirmed that earlier today or yesterday yep. uh, and it's just a guy okay for a second think about this he's 29 years old he is a professional, world-class professional footballer, which means he has Olympic level fitness. Yes. And he having literally no signs of anything. Now, the interesting thing, obviously, I have an intimate appreciation for Christian Eriksen. He's one of the best Spurs players to ever wear the shirt, frankly, uh, but certainly in the last, you know, 15, 20 years. Um, and there were seasons, his last year at Spurs, he played every game, every game. Every tournament, every game, every every everything, and he was just a horse. And you know, part of the reason he left was you know Pochettino sort of ran him into the ground, not you know, not literally, but he yeah. he he was just yeah. He liter now he literally ran himself into the ground. Well, yeah, like literally at this yeah. point. I and think the thing that to 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 take a step back with Spurs was that they would try and rest him. The team would be completely disjointed, unable to create anything. And the thing Erickson would do, and I posted this on on our on the Squeaky Bum Time chat uh, in our group, is he wouldn't do a lot, but what he did was incredible. It was a touch, a flick around the corner, a hold for a moment, and then a release. It was these subtle things where he was on the ball for fractions of seconds and completely changed games. Yeah, right. And he uh, that's he aside from his. That's and that was the thing because he wasn't he wasn't a runner he wasn't a he wasn't big and burly he wasn't Hoiberg he wasn't the weird thing Sissoko. is he, he was he, if you look at the guy. stats if you look at the stats of how much he actually ran during the matches he ran the most he was all over the pitch right it was a pressing aggressive you know high up front team he actually did but the optics sometimes where he would sort of he would be walking or something and it wasn't that he was lazy it was that he was reading the play and getting into the right position or like had a heart to... murmur and didn't tell anyone well maybe but <laughs> um but yeah i mean you know so so that whole scene was jarring i was talking to a good friend of mine um who is a, is a doctor and what he was saying and this is before anything had come out he was saying that his friends like his group chats with all of his doctor friends who are far more successful than us um 
they were appalled at how long it took to administer CPR. And I was like, really? Now, keep in mind, it was the far side of the field, right? I mean, they, they hauled ass as best they could. And that what they said was, and, and the interesting thing was, we'll get into the media coverage in a second, but like it took, from the time he hits the ground, it takes about 90 seconds for them to administer CPR. Now, I'm not criticizing anybody here. That's factual. That's right. That's basically what had happened. And when you think about that and, and how precious every second is in that situation that scares the shit out of you you know 90 yeah. seconds goes by and and so the fact that they were able to get him back and they did confirm he was dead on the field and they got him back and they had the defib they defibbed yeah. him right and they, they they gave him one jolt and he came back and it's just it's it's it, it scares the shit out of me and and I, I loved this guy for years and it has nothing to do with how much I loved him. He could have been the best player, the worst player he left on bad terms. It doesn't matter. You think about y- yourself, right? Like daily blend was playing for net Netherlands yesterday or today. Yeah. I don't even remember anymore, but he, uh, yesterday he had had heart problems and he was a friend of Christian Eriksen's from their days at Ajax, maybe I think anyway, yes, I um, he was, he was shattered. He was just br- broken down in tears. Right. And so getting back to that, that counter, right. I thought the media coverage was so interesting. Um, it was good. There will be, pe- there will be people who will criticize, you know, you can, you can show the, the, you know, Casper Schmeichel consoling his wife who is beside herself. She might be losing her, you know, Christian Harrison, blah, 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 her boyfriend, whatever. Uh, Yes, I understand. But you also, if, if anybody's going to cast a stone here, and if you're going to be reactive on social media, and you're going to freak out about shit, put yourself in that cameraman, that producer, that play-by-play man shoes for they a hot second. They got to tell people what's going on. Right. And so it's not like there's a pitch invader where you're like, oh, yeah, some sure shit ends on the field again. Uh, hold on. And he got tackled, and the game's back underway. That was a, a traumatic event. Thankfully, not and further news. more traumatic. And frankly, yeah, newsworthy. But, but yeah. It's it, tricky. It just, like, you don't want to show the leg break three times, right? Right. It's a very – it's not. It's worse. It's very similar, though, to, like, the Dak Prescott injury or, like, Joe Theismann or, so, you know, something like that. It's, it's just – It was incredible. It was it was wild. And so going back, you know, and, and I have a long standing history on this show of bashing ESPN. I thought that they did a really good job. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. In the moment, did. because there was just such such gravitas and such. I, yeah. You know, yeah. I think I think, you know, you shoot right on places. ESPN for it and that I read it and whatever. The fact of the matter is, it is still the primary sports brand in the United States. They still have the biggest coverage. They still have the biggest sports. Mm-hmm. And, you know, whether whether we like it or not, ESPN FC is on every day. It's the only soccer show you can watch every day, yeah. right? Now, it's not a YouTube channel. Yes, there are YouTube guys, but most of those guys are like us. They're sitting in front of a green screen talking shit, and good for them. They're doing awesome, too. But ESPN has still has a little bit of juice. Now, do they cover Man United, Real Madrid, Barcelona every day? Yes. And does Craig Burley get mad about talking about the Ballon d'Or? Yes. Sure. And does he shit on Seb, uh, on Sebi, Sebastian Salazar all the time? Yes. And it's great. But in this case, Salazar is hosting. He's being very glum and like, holy shit. They have Christian Fuchs on, who I'd heard on Men in Blazers several years before. He's a big fan of America. He's going to play, I think, in the MLS. I'm not sure. Uh, soon. And he was really good. He was on giving player perspective. Yeah, I thought so. I just... I was just glad that uh, Diego, the, the, Daniela, that uh, one of the Italian guy is not on there. He's terrible because uh, I can't understand him. Um, but Burley was in the moment. Like he was just, he was shook. Yeah, he was. And they let it roll and they did not cut away. And they stayed there for the 20 minutes of should they play? Should they not play? Fuchs is like, this game should be over. What are we doing? Yeah. And then they pop out after 20 minutes, which is somewhat insane. When you think about it, the guy almost dies on the pitch, and they're like, "Got to play." Uh, well, okay, but, but they so, made it. But they made a decision, right? They had so to going do back something. to, I wanted to expand on the the ESPN thing because, like I was saying, you know, there was controversy about whether they should or shouldn't have shown what was going on the replays. 
he could have, like I said, he could have had a heat stroke. He could have, it could have been anything. But so they showed it and they went, oh, fuck, this is really bad. And they cut that. And like, then you said they went back to studio. They went to that, that round table, like living room scenario where they yeah. brought in Taylor Twelman and Steve McManaman. And I thought that Twelman was the guy who that I mentioned like the 90 seconds before. He went back and he was telling, he counted how long it took. And he was just, he was flabbergasted by, you know, not, and again, he wasn't criticizing anybody. It was just authentic. And it was in the yeah, moment. Like everybody was like, this terrified. is how long it took. I'm counting. Yes. Right. And so he's like, you know, if this is what's going on and we're all speculating, but if this is what had happened, then this is, this is horrifying news. Right. So yeah. um, I thought it was so, so interesting. Thankfully he was awake before he left the field. He was, you know, the thing is the thing that was okay. The thing that's amazing about it is what color was he? He was chalk white as though someone who died. Right. Yeah. The pictures of him, he looks like yeah. the blood came out of him because it did. Right. Mm -hmm. He looked yeah. Yeah. really, really bad. And it's making but, me sick thinking about yeah. it. Really. The weird thing is, is, you know, ultimately, you know, Kajar and, and the rest of the team, they were basically put an ultimatum in the locker room and told you can play today, play tomorrow or take a three nil forfeit. Yeah. And that was what they gave him. The PR from UEFA was bad, saying that the players chose to play enthusiastically. Basically. Well, for, and now again, whatever it's PR spin or where, from what I understand, Erickson spoke to the team at the hospital because he was awake when he left the field. Right, on FaceTime. On That's, FaceTime. I heard that same story. And I, listen, take it for what it is. Um, they played. There is no correct answer most yeah. importantly okay yeah. they could have played today or that game that day they could have played the next day are they going to be any less shook that their teammate almost died i don't, I don't know. know you know like it does a does a, a night to sleep on it and make it anything better? i think we're speculating and sort of splitting hairs it was a traumatic event and it's going to continue to be a traumatic event yeah. i i think about it and i and i get sick a little bit yeah so they play the game uh, the game actually was just before halftime when this had happened. So right. they, they go into the break two minutes. They go into the, like a five minute break yeah. and then they come back out. Um, and you can, first of all, Denmark is a team that is run completely through Christian Erickson. That is his team. So it is, he's, it he's is, the it bail. Is. He's the bail equivalent. Although uh, Denmark's probably better than Wales, but still. Oh, I was going to go the other way. I don't think they have the supporting cast that Wales does, but nonetheless, uh, if you take that player off the field, they are going to be worse, significantly worse. Now, significantly. If, but if you take them off the field in the traumatic fashion by which they, it had happened, I don't know how anybody expected Denmark to get a result out of that game. And so Finland, who is playing in their first European championship ever, correct? Correct. Uh, they get a goal. Because uh, uh, nice, Schmeichel just makes a mistake. It's a nice goal, but yeah, Schmeichel makes a – I hate to – it they hit him in the hand. It's a reactive. Mistake. Yeah, he it fucked up somehow. Yeah, he didn't He didn't make as clean of a save as he would have liked, and it squeaks through him, and it's 1-0 Finland. Yeah. Finland. He normally and makes that save, though. I would agree. Um, and I don't – Again, you don't put yourself in these players' shoes like you can't. But like, I don't, I don't buy that in that moment he messed up. No, it the, makes for a better stage. narrative. Like, oh, he was thinking of Erickson and fucked yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, no, he. I wasn't. mean, he wasn't thinking about a hundred and fifty percent on football, but you know, whatever. So, right, whatever. And and the well, and the difference is that uh, they kind of get thrown a lifeline, right? There was a horrible, horrible penalty call in the late later in this game yeah. and P, our boy Hoybier steps oh. up and he has a really, really poor penalty yeah, uh, and it's stopped by Finland and they lock it down and they escape one nil. So um, it's, it's extremely unfortunate that it was a historic win and goal for Finland. And it's just sucks that it's in the context of everything else, completely a footnote, but it, yeah, the it, game doesn't matter, but it matters because they got to keep playing. Right. Right. And so, you know, I think about just wrapping up the Erickson stuff, like I, it, it his career could be over. In fact, Oh, it's he, over. His he, career is over. Argue it should be over. And no, because no team, no team would, it would hire him because if he dies, you'd have to do it without any insurance. You'd be like, no, I'm not insuring him. There's no, no I know. I, I know. They have and, to and, clear him like quadruple cleared, cleared, cleared. Um, right. But let's, let's, 
after that sort of deep note, let's sort of go through the games, right? Because we, our show came on the day of the first game. First game was Italy versus Turkey. Can I just say, uh, Mancini, the whole Italian staff in the fucking gray suits, they looked incredible. Like, just Italians, just stop with the fucking suits. They look <laughs> so good. And he looks like a movie star and he's tanned. And American coaches look like fat guys who got off a golf cart and, and, and are trying to wear less suits. And the Italians are like, no, 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 we're going more suits. So yeah. they looked incredible. Italy was really good. Turkey was disappointing. We, we thought they'd be a little bit better. But again, these teams that play defensive, they just, again, I just think Turkey doesn't believe they're in this class, even if they might be better, right? I mean, and look- Italy walked into this tournament as one of the aggressive favorites yeah. and they showed up in the first game. Yeah. And but scoring three goals, they haven't scored three goals no, in like four no. years. Well, okay, hold on. But they scored three goals, but two of them were late on. Right. So it was oh, kind sorry. of like, sorry, that's not true. Italy scored a lot of goals, but they had 11 against the Faroe islands and nine against the Maldives. No, I know. But the, what they, I'm they, saying is like, that doesn't count. They got, they got, a, they got an own goal. A, a good bounce and so then the game opened up right, right so but they, they got kind of own goal on a goal that's a goal right no, it, I, his I'm, own goals and then his own goals right sure but what i'm yeah, saying yeah. is the game opened up after yeah. that uh immobile and insignia they they added that on but i don't think turkey was ever really up for it right they then you 36 percent yeah. possession so I'm and we, not, we 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 switch on to switzerland switzerland always pretty good but never good enough but this is they're better than wales and the XG showed it. They they were ahead in this game, uh, but they couldn't pull it out. Uh, Wales with the late draw on an incredible set piece play, three touches into the striker Kiefer, who's plying his trade in the championships More. for Cardiff. Okay, He's so had his first thoughts. twenty goal season with the freaking band, bandage on, and Finland and Wales like they do, they squeak one out in Baku. So <laughs> this was the first of several incredibly entertaining games and it sucks yeah. that we had we obviously had to lead with the Ericsson stuff because yeah. it's the biggest story but this tournament has been super fun and there's been yeah. at least one game a day where it's and there's been clunkers and we'll talk about that too but there's been at least one game a day where the, and this was the first one we like this is awesome this guy i mean i'm key for more and this is my introduction to him of course but i mean he is seven feet tall and and yeah, watching Bale guy. interact with him gave me vibes of him and Peter Crouch, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, it was awesome. And I, I just, all I kept thinking was why, uh, when I saw him, I thought Olivier Giroud and mm -hmm. I went, why doesn't a premier league team have him on their side as a super sub come in 65 minutes. He's a horse and he just out muscles and throw the ball in the air. Reminds me of, of well the, the the reason for that is is that teams figure it out. It it is for uh the in between the sort of change of pace. The interesting thing about Kiefer Moore is first of all, he's not from soccer player country. He's from Torquay, which is basically like beach resort town. How he gets found, I don't know. He plays he plays for his local team in Yeovil, which you probably don't know this, but Torquay and Yeovil about one town over from each other, which is odd. And he works his way up. He plays plays in the National League. This guy has come from literally nowhere. <laughs> yeah. Like in the National League, which is the lowest, which is the fifth level of England, then goes to Ipswich on loan, doesn't really do much. Rotherham has a big season. Barnsley, we know that's the Billy Bean team. They probably found him and were like, you're big, you're not bad. So that's one of those analytics things, finding... Uh, that he plays for Wigan in a team that had a 10 point deduction. They go down, but he helps them. Actually, they, it was unfortunate that Wigan went down on a deduction. And then this year with Cardiff, he scored 20 goals playing three over three and a half thousand minutes in the championship. That means that dude has been playing every day, <laughs> twice a week. <laughs> yeah. For 18 months. Right. And he's six, five, but he has a very strange middle name. I'm very excited. Why is he Kiefer Roberto Francisco Moore? <laughs> find out we'll we'll, we'll come we'll up on that, that next up. episode yeah <laughs> but um, the uh the, the the swiss play well they keep the possession but wales has a good fighting spirit there's no yeah. doubt that wales has a good strong team spirit they have guys that have been that have been playing together for a long time specifically i think about ramsey joe allen and bale really long-term connection with each other uh, ben Davies as well. These are guys that have been the core of this team now for their whole kind of like run 
making the Euros four years ago, now five years ago, having that semifinal run. You know, a great p- tournament play, what I think people don't understand is it's worse than regular play. Like international football is, the quality is lower than the Champions League or Barcelona. Like Barcelona destroys all these teams. Well, yeah. Combined, you, you, you get to bind the teams team. together, right? You yeah. To, yeah. Yeah. You get to build your team so, at Barcelona. So you get teams, what you get. Right. These teams live off of, long-term muscle memory of a guy who's played with a guy that he sees once every four months and and for tournaments especially Mm -hmm. smaller countries where they have smaller uh selection pools the guys who play for wales will play for wales as a unit for 10 years right unless they have a really good crop of players so the wales team is strong it's tight you see the best version of bale he can really get out of that madrid bullshit get out of get out of the, oh, he doesn't run enough, get out of that stuff and really just be appreciated for what he is, which is a guy you can give the ball to and he just simply makes things happen. So your Wales pick is doing well. Uh, Belgian dispatch uh, Russia pretty easily. No De Bruyne, he didn't travel, but Belgian is one of the favorites of this group. Lukaku is, um, Lukaku is good. He's he is, hitting his peak form. And yeah, I thought- He's really, really good. So they they- you know, they put one on Russia, three, nothing, but Russia gave the game away. Right. So in the what 10th or so minute, yeah, they, couple gave, big mistakes. they, they couple big mistakes, but they gave Lukaku a goal, which by the way, in getting back to Christian Erickson, he, you know, he did uh, a tribute, ran over to the camera said, I Class. love you, buddy. Class. Um, I, the other, there's so many other elements. To this, there were three, three, maybe, maybe more teammates of Christian Erickson, Lukaku currently and and Vertonghen's son and, as well. Well, I meant in this in game. Your, okay, yeah, yeah. Vertonghen and Alderweireld, who Grew they're very him. very close, right? Yeah. Vertonghen and Alderweireld played with him again at Ajax for mm-hmm. years, mm-hmm. and so you know it's. I couldn't. I couldn't imagine. Yeah, it's just intense you know? relationships that these guys have that we. Yeah. Especially this last COVID season, where guys literally didn't see their families and just saw each other. Right. They. Uh, yeah. And then we have to sort of go into England, 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 uh, England win one nil on a Raheem Sterling goal. They really come out hard in the first 10 minutes. Uh, Phil Foden nearly scores an incredible phenomenal. goal. Uh, Foden, sorry, Raheem Sterling, who's literally f- from three blocks from the stadium. And he said, I'm at Wembley. I'm fucking scoring. Uh, he played great. The big change here was uh, more the, the Calvin Phillips play. It was Calvin Phillips. Thank you. I was waiting for it. If you didn't watch Leeds, which most of you didn't, uh, even though I told you to watch Leeds every goddamn week, he is their holding midfielder. Plays, if you're familiar with pre-last season, with City 17, 18, 19, he plays that role, (laughs) the Fernandinho role, where he's just in front of a four and they play a 4-1-4-1. But with England, Southgate really unlocked something where he was using the wingers uh, Foden and and Sterling as decoys in a way so that they would run and sort of hold up the ball and when they came towards their defenders to sort of support he would have the, the midfielders charge forward. Right. So it was very deceptive uh, to support Kane this really flexible 4-2-3-1 uh, four, two, three, four, two, with Kane up top but it was really good and Trippier is really good now having played in Spain and played with Simeone, he got a different education, right? He started at City, had that sort of early City Academy education, then Daesh, which is like a different version, oh, yeah. then then Pochettino, which is another version, like a BL Cisma, and then Cholismo at, at Madrid. So this is an English player who's getting a really diverse education in football, and it, and it helps England. Um, because, you know, Trippier and, and Walker actually played narrow and played, England was diverse, and I don't think Croatia, Croatia is not there anymore, right? The Kovacic, Modric, Brozovic, you know, they just, I forgot just didn't have the gear. Old, I forgot how old Modric is when He's I 36, picked 36, right? Group. Yeah, 35. And, yeah. and he did look good, right? I, I think Croatia he took a shot was, early to let yeah, people know he was there. Croatia was okay. Yeah. Uh, but England were good. And yeah. and England deserved to win the game, and 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 so they did. But yeah, I mean that that shot off the post by Foden, I just you know, I mean, yeah, you're I am not. A Manchester City supporter at all. But I love me some Phil Foden. I really do. And I was happy to see Raheem get a goal. I was. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, he gets killed. I mean, when England play bad, 
and this is, we just have to say it. There is this undertone of the players kneeling and some people booing. I don't think they're all racist. I just think they're just like, get off your fucking knees. Well, let's explore. So there's that something weird there, but then Raheem does get the brunt of wow. racial abuse because he tends to get in positions to score more than anyone else does and miss more than anyone else does. And when those misses add up and you lose, he's the one who gets murdered. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. I mean, it's, and it's okay. normal. It's normal. It's true of most any prolific attacker. You expect them to score every time if they're in the area and they have the opportunity. Um, but it does seem to focus a little bit more on Raheem for a particular reason that I yeah, can't put my yeah. finger I mean, and on. he did a really good job and he got, he got um, knighted for his uh, sort of work in the racism world yep. and like raising awareness because he started showing articles from the sun of like, this is what a young black player for England headlines are. And this yeah. is what a young, and he had like five different instances of like, they're talking about who buys a flash car for his mom. And the other one goes, look at poor old Mason Mount buying a car for his mom who worked so hard. They yeah. just do it over and over again. Yeah, and you're just yeah. like, hey, my geez, uh, you're not helping. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, but Sterling is from Wembley, basically. Yeah, yeah. And it was, it was, it was a nice goal, well taken. Um, it was well taken. It was shockingly well taken. But he did <laughs> remind us he's Raheem Sterling later on when he had a shot that was wide open that Kane let him take because Kane probably should have shot it. And Raheem shot it like to his house mm -hmm. in Wembley. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But, you know, the England fans were up for it. It was nice to see England playing well. The hyperbole, because we're such Premier League-centric fans, our sort of sources are Premier League, is just like, it's out of control. <laughs> and it then really they sort of segues into um, into Scotland playing because, you know, it's still the UK, and we'll sort of get in today's games, but we're Scotland gonna, being the last one. But we're going to talk about that and a couple of incredible, incredible goals right after this. Um Hey, Laurent, did you know that I'm getting married this year? I did know. You invited I, me. It's uncomfortable. I know. <laughs> I am. I have to think about it and deal with something else every other day. Uh, flowers, invitations, uh, just DJ, all the expenses. It's an incredibly Do ridiculous. Do clean industry. underwear? No, I don't even bother anymore. Okay. Um, but so uh, there's just all of these bills and it's can be overwhelming. Um, but you know, our friend uh, Joe at Attitude of Gratitude Consulting. Has oh, the guy who helps me with my family problems? Yes, about, exactly. About the, the same Joe. Saving, saving, the same uh, Joe. saving, saving me? Oh, yeah. I, I, I hit him up. You know, I've been talking about trying to figure out, you know, you, you put it last week about putting, you know, finding money in the couch cushion sort of thing. But it was effectively trying to make sure that, you know, we don't overextend ourselves, right? We want a, a lovely affair. But at the same time, we got to do what's right uh, and do this, the simple and smart thing in some cases as well. So um, it's been great talking to him and having him kind of talk me off of a ledge or two or four thousand and uh you know he's he's been un unbelievable uh i can't recommend him highly enough uh attitude of Gr gratitude consulting is the name of the company www.attitudeofgratitudeconsulting.com uh please visit it uh give our friend joe all of your attention if you have any different concerns whether it be children wedding any type of financial concerns you have uh he's your guy uh, he's been great for all of the Chop Net Sports Network, uh, you know, different podcast hosts and all that stuff. We can both vouch for him personally. Give him a shout. Attitude of Gratitude Consulting .com. Yeah. And uh, as you know, I've been talking, you know, if I'm going to your wedding, I've got to be ready. And uh, the gang at Sunflower Meadow Seasoning has been providing me with all their amazing seasonings to help me get through my um, my keto diet. Uh, they've found the right ones that mix to me. What they are, Sunflower Meadows is really like a, a really cool supplier of different seasonings. You put, They send you these amazing packets and give you the recipes to put things together from beer nuts to dry rubs to whatever, slushies, dessert mixes, anything you want and in a cool way to spice up your meals so that they're a little bit different. Sometimes, you know, when you're in the middle of these kinds of diets or fads or whatever, you just dying for something to connect with you. And at Sunflower Metal Seasonings, they will provide those things for you. And uh, I recommend you go to the site at sunflowermeadowseasonings.com. They have wonderful, a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful mascot that's all over the site. 
tell him I sent you. Go check it out. It's the cutest thing you'll ever see. I'm not going to give it away, but it rhymes with, uh, no, I'm not even going to give it away. It doesn't rhyme with anything. But yeah, check out Sunflower Meadow Seasonings. They're out in New Jersey. They're helping us out a lot and down in Woodbridge. And we're looking forward to getting more stuff from them. Back to the games. Yeah. And so uh, I want to we're, we're, I want to break the cycle a little bit. We were going through the games and all that stuff. There already have been two and almost three. We'll talk about the third one later in the show. Well, we talked about Foden's was pretty badass. Well, okay. So almost four then, but two ridiculous, ridiculous goals. Uh, which one do you want to start with? I want to start with Schick because yeah, I know. Yeah. Uh, Schick is a player for um, uh, in the Scotland Czech Republic game. Schick and Scotland is at home. This is a big deal. This is Scotland's first tournament since 1998. They're at home in Handham Park, the home of Rangers. Uh, and they're playing well. Schick plays in Germany. He's this, he's their talismanic. He's young. He's pretty handsome. Actually, he's very handsome. Jesus, he's I very just, handsome. I just looked at his picture. And he picks up a ball and a little bit of a turnover in well, the Well, he had already scored. Yeah, he had already scored. But this second goal is just he's what? 25. He's maybe oh, 10 yards years. from the halfway line. I think the just, measurement I saw was 48 yards away. Yeah, and he just drops it right into the goal. These are, they don't seem that incredible until you think about how often they happen and they basically never happen. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's and so on average, like once every year and a half, I'd say. Yeah, every Probably two years. The last year. one was Rooney, I guess, was one of the last ones. Kane did it in the preseason against Juve. That's the last time I remember it, but yeah. yeah, Ro it, Rooney did it at Everton uh, yes. against, I think, Crystal Palace. So, you know, the you get the, the goalkeeper running around going, oh God! Right. And he drops it over his head. But what's what's your goal? What were you on about? Yeah. Um, I mentioned when we were going through the Ukraine um, before friend. before the game uh, before the game started on our last show, uh, our Andre Yarmolenko. And I think of him because at in his days at Dortmund, he uh, had terrorized Spurs and he scored a very similar goal to what he did the other day. And uh, it's one of those where he plays, he's a left footed winger comes off the right and he just stroked something past Loris. It was one of those where like, we scored an early goal at Wembley and we're like, all right, we got these motherfuckers and like bang right back. And I was like, Ooh, and I never forgot this guy's name because of that. I didn't know who he was before the game, but. Well, the, the thing, the thing with Yarmolenko is one, he's glass. He gets hurt all the time. Yes, Two, and that's what I said on the last show. Gigantic and built like a center forward, but mm -hmm. he is a tricky winger. Like, he plays yeah. more like Riyad Mahrez than, uh, you know, who's a good one? Chris Wood. He looks like Chris Wood, but plays yeah. like Riyad Mahrez. Yeah. So yeah. He just, <laughs> he's kind of got the quality of, uh, of Iron Robin in that he has one move, and that one move is a nuclear reactor left foot that he fires – all the time, no matter what, if you're open and you're on side, he will not pass to you. He will not pass to you on Tuesday. He is shooting that shot every time, all the yep. time. Uh, he's currently on West Ham and he's a breaking case of emergency player for, yeah. for David, for David Moyes, who's just like, you know, you could do some running. <laughs> you could probably close some guys down. He brought David Moyes uh, of, 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 uh, of West Ham fame probably sees him and goes, you're a big fucking unit of a lad. Go fuck someone up. What yeah. are you doing? And he's like, nope, I'm just going to do this thing that I do. <laughs> but when he does it and it works, you're like, nice, awesome. He, so wait a minute. He's Ukrainian Lamella. That's yes. what he is. <laughs> Holy shit. He's, wow. I never thought yeah. about that. Um, but yeah, so he's in that legend. game, he's just... uh, getting, getting the actual games, right? So Netherlands, uh, they're playing they, the Ukraine. They they're battered them. They're the, yeah, they're the heavy favorite here. They had 62% possession, strong performance from the Netherlands until it wasn't. Uh, they go up 2-0 in the 58th minute. Wout Weghorst uh, puts them up 2-0. And they think, you know, we're, we're done here, right? Um, Yarmolenko scores that absolute screamer. Uh, again, cutting it off the right, curling it around the keeper. And now all of a sudden, 
Ukraine has life so much so that they tie it four minutes later. And now Netherlands is, is shitting their pants, right? Um, <laughs> yes, they it really was. It was a frenetic second half, five goals in total. Um, yeah. But Dumfries gets the winner in the 85th and, yeah. uh, and Netherlands sort of, they escape with a win that they deserve. It was kind of, it's a very, very strange game, right? And that's kind yeah. of where, you know, Laurent was saying earlier. Um, I don't trust them at all. No, I don't. Oh, of course not. But what they're I mean, a mess. Gen- the generally, reason with international play is that like this shit can happen because it's it, it's far less predictable because yeah. the the ebbs and flows and are. Plus, there's only a few games for you to drop. The thing is, is that the Dutch played without any structure, and that's the problem. Like it was through the midfield, no problem. This is a this is a Dutch team that's got Wijnaldum, uh, Darun, and De Jong in the midfield. They should never get run through in the midfield ever yeah. and they were just like oh okay let's just let's fuck let's play like it's in the park let's fuck around oh there's a guy named zuboff oh no zubkoff i just i had uh, i have uh, memories of, of sergey reference? zuboff <laughs> My, <laughs> brian leach's partner on the power play That's very right. important cog to the old uh new york rangers stanley cup winning absolutely the greatest Which was moment of my life yesterday uh, <laughs> technically 27 years ago i don't want to talk about it anyway. yeah don't talk about it you didn't see um, uh, yeah. i was six my dad I was not six yeah, I know. I know. uh so so the dutch get through i don't trust them people there's a weird thing with the dutch everyone wants to love them and doesn't really think about the fact that the country has 15 million people and hasn't actually been good for a while but they li- it lives on on total football. It, it really is a testament to style over anything else. And the Dutch have been married to a style, even when they don't have the players to play it. Their weakness right now is they don't have someone to score goals. Although Weghorst has scored like a hundred goals in the in the in the Bundesliga, he's worth looking into as a player. But you know how those Bund- those those Dutch strikers are. You know, can't punt is Yan- Yan- Where's Jansen? Is he somewhere is in Mexico? Jansen? Yeah, he's in Mexico. <laughs> yeah that basically means if for a european if you're in mexico you're basically dead yeah you're on a yeah. beach yeah which you're listen, hanging out you're getting paid to play football and you're but very grateful to be doing to, it to be fair the netherlands ukraine game was probably the best game it was the most fun game uh let's get to a less fun game spain nil sweden nil Ugh. See, what no, did I, I i thought it was an f- interesting game i just it's a uh, spain spain Come spain, on. spain it's morata it's this Possession, possession, this. possession. They just don't have a finisher. They still have all the class. They have Coque and Pedri and Dani Almo. And they have all the players' names that you know. Even Americ Laporte and, and, and Marcus Lorente. All these guys are champions. These are the champions of Atletico. Half the team is made up of players from Atletico. They still can't finish. It's just shocking. I would think that... I would not touch Murata. I don't think he's going to no. be their guy. I just don't trust him at all. Even if he, I know what we always say with great strikers who don't finish. We had this with Werner, who actually did help the goal in the Champions League. Is they do all the other stuff, and I'm like, yeah, but I can. Can he just score? I don't care Where about the, the other opportunities stuff. that that Murata gets. It's comical at this point, you know, and. Uh, watching Spain, I didn't see a, uh, a lot of the first half, but I did catch the highlights. And then I sat down for the second half. Jordi Alba was like playing four positions. Yeah, he's always playing four positions. Yeah, I know. But like, if you've got this much talent on the field, I just, I understand he's making runs forward. But the only, th- it was like the, the guy in FIFA who has one move. He kicks it out left to, to Alba and he crosses it in to try and basically play a pinball and have it f- yeah. fall to somebody's feet. Now, to be, there was to be, no structure whatsoever yeah. in the midfield. Not to be fair, the Swedes, this is what they do. Oh, and absolutely. Man of the match was Victor Lindelof. Just, they just kept everything out. The Spanish are small and the Swedes are not. And they will batter you and eventually get the goal. Uh, I know I didn't watch all the full highlights, but you said that my guy Isaac had a shot and Dude, almost scored. So- this is the third of the three goals that I thought were almost goals. Um, he finds himself on the edge of the area with three Spanish defenders kind of closing in on him. And he does this kind of like pirouette, like Roy head feet. fake. Yeah. And he loses all three of them. Oh. And he crosses it across the, the six yard box to, I think Berg or uh, Lars. I'm not actually sure who, ha- who uh, a generic Berg. Swedish looking white guy. Okay. Well, they and all he, look amazing in their pictures. Oh my and God. he duffs it 
from six yards and he just doesn't even come up there. I thought watching it live, I was like, Oh, the defender got a touch on it. Nope. <laughs> nope. The guy just, just, the guy just, and this is it. like 70th minute. This is three points on the line for Sweden here. So I'm looking at this. I mean, Spain had an aggressive, insane amount of possession, something like seven, yeah, but it doesn't matter. It's 80, no, 86% possession. Yeah. That, that, and they still, sh- in, for my money, Sweden should have came away the winner here. It was, uh, yeah, but I, 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 call, I, I called out, uh, Alexander Isaac. He's playing in Spain. He, he could be the difference maker. Granted, that would have been Zlatan's spot. Zlatan probably would have found a way or been yelling at his teammates. But, you know, the, the nice thing about the European Championships is there's a lot of parity within the group. I wouldn't say because we do have one strong team in France, but, they're the French and they're already fighting and they generally implode once every third cycle. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> right. Right. True. So in 2002, 2002, they imploded. And then in 20, after winning in 98. Right. And then in 2010, they completely imploded mm-hmm. where the team, where the players went on revolt against the coach <laughs> yep. and guys left. Uh, so, but they're back up again. They have the best structure to create teams. And then Germany's down right now basically because they didn't have the guts to fire their coach, which is what they should have done. Yeah. But they needed a, a new voice. And I think where they are right now is they've still a lot of guys from the world cup in Brazil on the team. He hasn't been able to do what frankly is the most difficult thing to do in sports, which is take your Mullers and take your Hummels and say, you're done. Yeah. But you can only do that is if you play better than you did without them. The problem is they're playing worse. So he had to bring them back in. Muller's had two incredible seasons with like 25 assists. It helps to have Lewandowski be the person converting them. But, you know, Muller has never been a classy footballer. He kind of is in places and does a weird touch. And his, his, he's had a bad haircut his whole life and clothes look weird on him. He's basically having Shaggy as your leading player for, for, <laughs> Ger- for Germany. He's like, Zoinks, let's go to go. Because that's, he's kind of a hillbilly that- German. That's that meme too, where it's like like the like he tells yeah. like a dad joke, and he's like, "Well, yeah, uh, yeah," because that's kind of, he's kind of a dork. Yeah, right. He's not cool. He's not Cristiano at all. He's like no. literally the opposite of Cristiano. He is the anti-Cristiano, absolutely. but he's a world-class, all-time great international player and one of Germany's greatest. And they had to bring him back in, and so Germany's a little bit shaky. Spain, we know, is possession, possession, beautiful, 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 no finishing. I think, mm-hmm. you know, David Villa would probably still be better than fucking Morata, uh, wherever he is. I think he's in Queens, which is a purgatory in and of itself. <laughs> Soldado. Bring Soldado back. Soldado? Um, sure. Why not? Any of those guys. But, uh, yeah. And, and so it's kind of wide open when you think about your S- Sweden, Denmark. England's a little bit better, but not that much better. No, no pedigree of doing great. Sweden, Denmark. Uh, you know, Spain's down. Italy is okay, but been poor lately. This could be anyone's tournament. Anybody yeah. gets hot, a goal scorer comes up. And what I'm trying to drive at is it's a uh, one goal, one player getting hot. You can win. Absolutely. It happens. Oh, or without question. like super duper team spirit and you're super defensive and you get a Greece or you get a Denmark 92, like we spoke about before, or even Portugal last time. Like that team had no right to fucking win no. the final with no Ronaldo. Um, so I, I, for my money, there's four call it giants, right? This is a question posed to us in, in, in our squeaky bum time Facebook group, which if you're listening to this and you haven't joined yet, please do. It's a lot of fun. Uh, all we do is sit there and just kind of talk football pretty much all day. Um, Mm. but so, okay. For my money, there's four quote unquote giants, uh, Italy, Belgium, France, and I would say in this, no, in this tournament. Okay. And I would say. Those are the three that I would lock in. Uh, the other one is some weird combination of now, I would say after that performance, England or Portugal or France. Well, we don't know um, how Portugal are doing. We yet. don't. But so that, but that's my point is that there's, there's three with like probably one roamer around. We don't really know. France is, but it's, you know, whatever. Um, so you look at this field and, and, and later today, match day one will come to a close with Hungary, Portugal. And as you mentioned, France and Germany in group F, um, who are the giant killers that you see out there? I, I still think that within, within group F, 
I still think that Portugal have a team spirit and they're a forgotten group. There was some chatter that they're un- overrated. I'm like, they're not overrated. One, they were European champions. Two, they got better. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the only question I have, and I don't know if they have a new keeper, uh, Patricio had a bad year at, at Wolves. I don't think they did. And, uh, and, if, and if, if, he's, if he's in goal, that worries me. There is a little bit of long in the tooth in the midfield. You have to see if Neves can still do it. How they fit in all the attacking talent and still play Ronaldo is a problem. But I love Diaz and I love Font, two defensive warriors who give zero fucks and will take you out and they will prevent goals from happening. And then, you know, this team spirit is still pretty strong. So that means that between Germany, France, and Portugal, there's going to be a team that's disappointed. And I think that the weakest of them is Germany because they have, yes, they're Germany, but their team spirit is pretty poor. And are they going to play Werner up top? Are they going to play Mueller up top? I don't know. They usually find a way, but they're not a good defense. And I think Lowe is in bad shape. Uh, I do like, from a giant killing perspective, Sweden were good in the last World Cup. I, I'll, I'll just put a flag on Sweden just because. Okay, I like that. Just for fun. Uh, you know, mine was we on our preview show. Uh, it's the Thomas Suchek love. I, I've got the checks. As, <laughs> as upsetting some apple carts here. Um, <laughs> They're in a weak group. They can absolutely, you know, take down Croatia. You know, no problem. And, the, and that's the thing is that uh, if you go back just four or five days, I had Croatia winning the group, and I now know the error of my ways. But I did say the Czechs would come in second in this group, so mm. um, I'm I'm big on them. And similar, okay, I know it's only three games and whatever, but it, it there are parallels to a longer Premier League season, right? Where it's like win the games you're supposed to win, and you'll be fine. You really right? need a win and a draw, and you're through. Right, and they've got yeah, they've got it essentially. They've got a two nil win over Scotland, so they've got the buffer on goal difference. Yeah. I mean, frankly, right now they're top of the group technically yeah. on goal difference, and they're yet to play Croatia and England, their two hardest games. But if you look at that, you go, okay, if they get one point from those two games, then they're most likely at worst going to be one of the third place teams that makes yeah. it through. Yeah, and w- one nice thing, uh, shout out our friends, uh, Cr- Cr- Sean Foreman and the Sports Reference Group that I always shout out and you know we'd love to love to connect with them but they've already got in the euro page for uh at fb ref they've already got the best third place team rankings already so Uh wales right now are there without hungary having played because they have a draw and a goal (laughs) right (laughs) and sweden have a draw and no goal oh god i just remembered that the tiebreakers are going to be total goals for third place teams isn't it something it's gonna be goal difference and then total goals oh yeah yeah. Buckle up, friends. It's going right. to be so silly. Yeah, it's uh, going to be super close. Somebody who's fourth, fifth, it's going to be like, I need to run up the score. I need to score two, uh, yeah. whatever. Uh, we do have to give a shout out to Chari, our friend, uh, who pointed out his boys from Austria, Marco Anantovic, yelling uh, slurs to the North Macedonians <laughs> in his in his native tongue of Serbia. Uh, loved it. Loved, always loved Arnautovic. He's a maverick. He's a weirdo. He's probably racist. I don't care. Uh, he, he was a, fun. He was fun at West Ham. Uh, he's he the kind of guy you, you you like. You know, it would be a fun season if Arnautovic was on Spurs, and he's the, <laughs> in, instead of instead of Lamella coming on, it's Arnautovic. You don't know if he's oh going to get a yellow, and you just get him, <laughs> or if he's going to shiv somebody. Yeah, um, he. I love the guy. I've always loved him. Whether you like him, the thing is, is that about Arnautovic, he is a character that you watch, right? The, yeah. we, we shouted out men and blazers last show. I'll do it again. Their, their big joke of the running season is the premier league script writers, right? Because yeah, yeah, there's yeah. this, this dramedy unfolding in front of you over 38 matches um, and, and six, seven months or whatever. Um, he was a supporting character in yeah. a sitcom or, or a drama where you're like that guy, every time that guy shows up, I kind of move to the edge of my seat a little bit. Right? <laughs> well, it's I mean, he's, 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 just, he's, he's, he's 29. He's now he's playing in China, barely playing. So I don't know what's happening there, but uh, I love me some, I, I was happy to see one of our characters and we know what's another thing you were talking about script writers. I was just thinking about the NBA and how, why don't they just make a reality show that sums up every week of the season? Like not a magazine, but like a real reality show. They all want to date a fucking Kardashian anyway. Might as well just make the NBA a reality show. Yeah. Anyway, 
with Feels characters like it already and is. the teams, but but better, like an actual produced show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get an hour of footage and kind of run it uh, as the season's going along and make it more interesting. Somehow the Premier League has managed to do that without being so weird, but there's so few teams you can really, you really get to know other teams. That's yeah. one thing to remember when you pick a league. There's no, no team, no leagues you have more than 20 teams. Mm -hmm. Not like the US where you're like, what? This is the 32nd team? This is so fucking <laughs> So we will we will speak to you again on Friday, uh, I guess yeah, Friday morning, mm -hmm. and on, before then we're gonna have a whole. We're, we're basically going to be halfway through match day two, mm -hmm. um, so it's gonna be really really fun. Friday is going to be Laurent's favorite day of the tournament. Oh, um, <laughs> we are going to have Scotland England at Wembley, three p.m. Eastern. That's gonna watch be it, watch it because it should. Although. The sad thing is, is that England is going to do another 30 days of lockdown. So it wasn't going to be full capacity. Otherwise, yeah. it would have been full England. Oh, uh, loony. they do it. They were going to do so full. They don't... They're not going to do lockdown. They're just no, no, no. not. Gonna... Not, it has nothing to do with COVID. They, they're doing a semi lockdown so they don't fucking kill each other. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we'll talk a lot more about that yeah. on, on next episode. Um, Turkey and Wales is a really, really pivotal game. Uh, it's Turkey effectively it's uh it's a it's a knockout game for Turkey now. If you yeah. go down three 0 in the first game, you need a result, and you can get one with against Wales. Don't get me wrong. Um, Italy Switzerland is going to be a fun one. Um, yeah, I I think that there's a few games. Uh, we mentioned Austria. We didn't talk a lot about them. They're going to have a, their their first really big test against. Well, that's Arnautovic. He'll come through. <laughs> no, no, that's what I mean. Like they're they're taking on the Netherlands. So there's a lot here. Um, so much fun. So, yeah, we've got six more games, eight more games between now and when we talk to you next. Um, the thing I'll leave you all with is get involved with it. Like the, the North Macedonia game was interesting, okay? Because Pandev just, has been playing for the team for 20 years. Yeah, exactly. There are storylines. There are narratives. There are – there's results and, yeah, it's, and twists it, and turns. It, it, has, it, has the, it has the quality of the Olympics in a way where there's a story on every team. Yeah, a way. It's a, it's you can a make parallel. a story for all of them. You know, sometimes the World Cup has been famous for the shitty teams, right? Like South Africa in 2010. Everybody just loved them. Oh, and the freaking... that goal against Mexico. I thought about that yesterday. I yeah. love that goal. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let me just uh, let's let's just wrap it up. Uh, that was the Squeaky Bum Time podcast with Mike Salerno and Laurent Cortines. We are the football wing of the Chop Sports Network. We record on Tuesdays and Fridays. So be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcast so you never miss an episode. And if you're listening on Apple, please rate and review the show so we can have more lunatics listening to the show. Mike, it's the first episode. It is, but I'll give you one last chance. France and Germany, who do you got? I've got the Maginot line being overrun uh, <laughs> by, the, is. by the Panzers. Uh, hopefully, no, France is going to annihilate Germany this time. This there time, it counts. it's going to be Verdun all over again. Uh, 